Welcome to this fifth lecture on the foundations of software testing. I'm going to talk today about the impossibility of complete testing. And given that you can't test everything, I introduce a few basic parts of test estimation. How much can you test? Our primary readings today are Doug Hoffman's case study on testing the mass bar computer and my paper on the impossibility of complete testing. Last time, I demonstrated that complete structural coverage doesn't mean complete testing. Two tests are distinct if each one can find a bug that the other one can't. To achieve complete testing, we'd have to reach a point where we know that we found all the bugs, and that would require running every distinct test. To achieve complete testing, you'd have to test all the individual variables, all the combinations of values of the variables, all the ways you can order the tasks that you do with the program, all the hardware and software configurations you can run the program on, and all the variables, features, and sequences that might interact with configuration, all the ways the program might be interrupted by other programmers running at the same time, and all the ways that people might use the program. That's a lot of tests. So let's get started by looking at individual variables. The usual approach is to test variables with a few values. We should check normal operation and we should check error handling. So we give it some values that the program should accept and process normally, and we give it some values that are too big, too small, too strange. Maybe we try a few special cases as well. In preparing for this lecture, you probably analyzed a function that reads a 32-bit word from memory, interprets it as an unsigned integer, and reports its square root. There are two to the 32 possible inputs to this function, just over 4 billion. None of these values is invalid. No matter what you intend to store in this location in memory, letters, negative numbers, floating points, doesn't matter. It's a 32-bit word, it holds 32 ones and zeros, and the program is gonna read them as an integer. If the function reads 64 bits instead of 32, there are two to the 64 possible values. That works out to a few quintillion. We can choose to test a small sample of these. Now compared to a billion or a quintillion, even a thousand tests is a small sample. No matter how we optimize that sample, we can't be sure that we've exposed all the bugs, and therefore we can't consider this sample a complete test of the function. Let me say this directly to experienced testers. You've probably studied a data sampling technique called domain testing. Maybe you studied it as boundary analysis or equivalence class analysis. If you test all the values that this technique tells you to test, that might be a good set of tests, but it is not a complete set. Doug Hoffman illustrated this incompleteness in his report of testing the built-in math functions for the MassPAR computer. MassPAR is a super fast computer. It has 64,000 parallel processors. The MassPAR designers expected their machines to be used for critical national security tasks. One of the applications I've heard mentioned is targeting nuclear missiles. It's a good thing to get the math right on computers like this. MassPAR had built-in floating point functions. One of them read a 32-bit word as an integer and computed its square root. When I asked students to estimate how long it would take to run all four billion inputs into that function, most tell me it would take an impossibly long time. Students with black box testing experience, years of experience, were among the most adamant to telling me it would be impossible to run all these tests. Knowing that there are too many tests to run, most people would test the smallest and the largest number, zero and two to the 32 minus one. Many people would also test powers of two, one, two, four, eight, 16, and so on. In terms of bit patterns, these numbers have 31 bits set to zero and one bit set to one. There are 32 tests with one bit set. There are 32 more tests with 31 bits set to one and the odd bit set to zero. Some people add random numbers or they add their favorite numbers or other values they have some personal suspicion about. But very few people suggest more than 100 tests. Rather than assuming that this was an impossibly big task, Hoffman decided to check it out. How long would it really take on a mass part computer? The answer was six minutes. So we ran all the tests. Two tests failed. Two tests out of four billion tests failed. 4,294,967,293 tests didn't fail. Only two failed. Neither test input was anywhere near any boundary value. None of the 66 tests that I described would have exposed these two bugs. So how do you find bugs like this? Either you test exhaustively like Hoffman did, or you find them by luck. Maybe luck is helped by a huge random sample, but luck. Now consider the 64-bit function. For this, you need even more luck. You have two to the 64 tests instead of two to the 32. It takes 24 billion minutes, 49,000 years of computer time to test them all. You can't do that. So even though you have software that probably has life-critical implications, you can't look in all the places because you just don't have enough time. Now, there are other strategies for improving the reliability of software. 
careful code reviews, test-driven programming, but from a black box testing viewpoint, there are more tests to run than you can possibly run. Hoffman's test focused on a function that read data from a known location in memory. He didn't have to consider how data got into that location. When you test human input, you have a lot more opportunities for misbehavior. For example, when you enter a number, you can edit while you type. You can type 123, then backspace and replace it with 456. Can this confuse the program? Another amusing type of input problem happens when you type very quickly or very slowly, or when other computer activity is draining processor time. Try this on your phone. Start dialing, enter six digits, and wait. After about a minute, the system times out. It gives you an error tone or an error message. What if you dial your seventh digit just as the system is about to time you out? This was a common source of bugs in phone systems. There are timeout intervals in most multi-user systems and in many other types of real-time systems. Timeouts cause a lot of mischief when you're entering several values into a dialog or data into several dialogs and you get timed out halfway through. What does the program do with your partial set of data? We have other risks to consider when the variable we're testing is a result variable instead of an input variable. For example, suppose we multiply two numbers together. The inputs might be valid, but together they might overflow the variable that holds the result. We have to design tests that try to force the overflow of an internal data type. And if the value will be displayed or printed, we also want to overflow the space reserved for displaying or printing that value. Underflows also cause failures. If you just press return in a data entry dialog, don't enter anything, you give the program an empty string, no data. Some programs fail badly with empty strings. Then there are Easter eggs. Easter eggs are hidden surprises in programs. If you type just the right sequence of characters at just the right place in the program, the program gives you a special response. Some eggs are jokes. Others have included departing programmers' criticisms of the company, abusive language, even animations of dancing naked women. Your company might not want to ship a product with these. Testing for Easter eggs at the user interface is a huge sampling problem. Any sequence of keystrokes could bring up an Easter egg. There's no length limit. You can't possibly test all the possibilities. Finally, let's consider clearly invalid input. Some testers, many programmers, won't bother testing for inputs that they know people won't do. So let's look at the consequences of that. It's 1997. On the USS Yorktown, a relatively famous cruiser in the United States Navy, a seaman entered a zero into a data entry field that everybody knew nobody would ever enter a zero into. It took everything that was connected to the ship's network down. The ship was powerless at sea for three hours. This is a warship at sea. Can't move for three hours. People will do things that you don't expect. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they don't understand the system. Maybe they expect the system to do something that the system designer didn't think of. Maybe they just drop something on the keyboard. Or maybe they're intentionally trying to do something you don't approve of. Your system has to cope with these inputs because they're going to happen. But you can't test for all of them. That's the point. Even when you're testing one variable at a time, you probably can't test everything that people can throw at that variable. You can test a lot, and it can be useful to know how long a thorough test would take, because sometimes you'll decide to run that huge set of tests, like Hoffman did. But most of the time, the best you can do is a sample.